Welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with your host, Dr. Nick Vanterhaven, and brought to you by ECG Management Consultants. You can learn more about the show on the program's page at healthcarenowradio.com or on our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud. The U.S. spends more on healthcare per capita than any other country on the planet. So why don't we have superior outcomes? Why haven't the principles of capitalism prevailed? And why do American consumers have so much trouble accessing and paying for healthcare? Each week, Healthcare Upside Down will dive into these and other issues with ECG principal, Dr. Nick, and guest panelists as they discuss the upsides and downsides of healthcare in the U.S. and how to make the system work for everyone. And we end with your better pill to swallow, the conclusion to today's episode with insights on challenges and changes that improve healthcare. Now here's your host, Dr. Nick. Hello, and welcome to Healthcare Upside Down with me, your host, Dr. Nick. This week's episode, the echo chamber of ideas. Have you heard of Clubhouse? The platform launched in April 2020, just a short 18 months ago. For most of 2020, it slowly built a user base, and then around December, user interest spiked. By January, 2 million weekly active users, and as of February, 10 million. Some of this could be attributed to some big-name celebrities and public figures like Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, Drake, Chris Rock, and Kevin Hart. So what does that have to do with healthcare, and why should you care? Turning healthcare upside down is going to require some different thinking and ideas. And while we are all well-intentioned in improving the system, we all come with our own sets of bias and reinforced by the people we work with, socialize, and go to conferences with. How do we step out of our own echo chamber to listen to people from around the world talking about their ideas, challenges, getting their perspectives, and getting smarter every day? Perhaps like Andy Weir, the author of the highly successful book and film, The Martian, you can crowdsource your next breakout success. My guest today is David Hunt, the founder and chief executive officer of The Considered, a new independent healthcare marketing agency who are breaking the rules to solve challenges, finding healthcare heroes, and unlocking the potential for a tech-enabled society. It's hard to move outside your own bias and echo chamber and find your invisible army of caregivers and patients behind the curtain. But David has found a way of tapping into this rich vein of resources. Dave, thanks for joining me today. Happy to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. So you're an advocate of the digital engagement uh, with a patient-centered approach, but I feel like that's at conflict. How can you bring those two together? If you've got more digital, you've got less patient engagement, we've got more technology, we've pushed the patient away. I don't see how you could not focus on both, you know, in terms of trying to unlock and improve outcomes. I think it's vital we kind of bridge that divide and make the most of it. You know, I've spent the last two decades of my career coming up with some good ideas, some quite good ideas, you know, and, and, and a lot of them have relied on technology and I believe could have had, and should have had a much more positive impact on society. And often we were thwarted by, yeah, but, you know, not everyone's on Google and not everyone's on Facebook. And then you end up, you know, with a piece of print. And I think one of the things I'm really advocating for is, is taking all those ideas and that confidence and that appetite and having a positive impact on patients' lives. So if you take that, I mean, you know, exactly the point, or they're, they're in this domain or they're in that domain, I, I think it, it feels like almost everybody is in Facebook or then maybe they're leaving at this point. How do you bridge all of those different divides if they're in different platforms and different versions? So, you know, paper-based. Or maybe all the elderly people like my parents, grandparents, they don't deal with technology. Is that true? I mean, I think one of the worst things you can do is, and I'm going to use the word today a lot, thwarts, like thwart an idea because not everyone's on the same platform. You know, it just takes heart. It takes more effort. It takes more determination. But you have to make sure you're developing solutions for where people are. And turning around and going, hey, we can't do this because not everyone's there is, is just simply not trying hard enough. I work very closely with an incredible human being called uh, Matt Eagles, who's a huge patient advocate 
and we used to travel the world together and do certain presentations. And someone said to him, he said, oh, I've heard all about innovation before. I've heard all about this digital technology before and it, and it never works. And Matt Eagles, who's had Parkinson's for four decades, he turns around, he goes, I fall over every day and every day I get, get up. What's your excuse? And that for me is the kind of determination heart we need to unlock the benefits of technology for all patients and all communities. It's too easy to turn around and go, we can't and we shouldn't do this. Uh, you know, and to that point, I think you've explored something that for me is very interesting. I think it's certainly out there in terms of most people's experience. There's a lot of people that are talking about it. I'm not familiar with too many folks that are there, but you have built a channel on Clubhouse. There had to be a point when you started that where you go, really, is anybody going to be there? Or maybe you just thought that was just going to emerge and it would be a great place for a conversation. Oh, I think it's hilarious. Everyone's like, Dave's mad. <laughs> what, what's Dave doing every morning having a cup of coffee? And um, I honestly do not care whether it did or did not succeed. For me, the key thing is experimentation because no one's got like a crystal ball and no one can say this is going to be a success or not uh, unless you're very, very smart, which I'm not. You know, but for me, it was it was the experiment and it was the exploration. And you know what? Again, with the right heart and the right imagination, the right empathy, it's turned into an incredible success. And I love the idea that every morning I have a cup of coffee and I listen to people from all around the world, from all around healthcare, talking about their ideas, the challenges, the perspectives. And, you know, every day, well, almost every day, I leave smarter than I arrive. Do you know what I mean? Because someone challenges me and goes, Dave, you're not right. Or a preconceived idea is, is actually just, just simply wrong. And you're learning all the time. And, and that's why I love it. And I don't love it because there's 2,000 members. I don't love it because 200 people turn up to a meeting. I love it because I have a conversation with a handful of people uh, who teach me, teach me something new. So, yeah. So the, there's a part of me that thinks it's not the platform. Is, is, is The platform is just an enabler in this. It seems a little bit like the sort of, I, I've heard about mastermind groups, or, although that seems like a closed group you've sort of pre-selected. I, I think the principle behind this is that it's entirely open. Anybody could come, right? And that's the bit I love the most because you, you and, I mean, you're speaking to me now, right? You're speaking to me now because of my experience and my credibility and my job title and my profile that's why you're speaking to me and if if you go to a congress you're almost entirely surrounded by like-minded people with like-minded views and like-minded seniority and we all know it's an echo chamber and it validates your own opinion i absolutely love that clubhouse is a democratized conversation i love the fact it does not matter if you're the ceo of pfizer or a, or a patient in eastern europe um, i love this equality that kind of comes from the platform and you're based, for me, you're not based in any way on your job title. You're based, you're, you know, you're just on your point of view. And I think that's really fantastic. So there's a little bit that goes on now that, you know, worries me about that. And I, I agree in the principle of this sort of open and actually getting outside. We're, we're all sort of subject to that bias that induces in us of just believing everything that occurs in our own echo chamber but there's a number of voices. I mean, I've tried to have conversations with people about difficult subjects that are um, very binary in viewpoint. I'll, I'll pick vaccines as an example, not that, that, you know, I want to have a discussion about that. But people have very strong views. Do you get folks on that platform? And how do you handle that kind of conflict that for some never resolves does it absorb the whole conversation or is there some way around that that you can still get value from this so i don't know how long this community will you know be sustained for i don't i don't know how it will evolve you know over the coming months and years like i don't and i don't know about the scale so i can only really comment on now and the vibe and the community we have which is definitely one of like openness um respect uh, one of my partners, Christine von Rasfeld, a uh, patient advocate, does a phenomenal job in terms of like moderating the room and, and making sure there's that really kind of inclusive uh, conversation that takes place. We have some, some pretty interesting subjects. So on a Monday, we talk about uh, diversity and, and um, inclusivity. And, and that, that's really interesting because we're talking with people from all around the world. 
and, and it means different things in different countries to different people. Um, but I only see the conversation has been positive. Again, might not agree with everything that's been said, but so much wiser for like hearing that point of view. And, and it's a little bit like I do with my, my children. It's going, you know, you can't necessarily take everything at face value. You know, you have to hear, hear and listen, and then you have to see, can find, you know, further evidence and, and reach an informed decision. And I think Clubhouse is exactly the same. You've got to, you know, see it as one potential data source and combine it with many others. So do you think that international com- component is a, a key contributor? We, we, we have a lot of the sort of national identities and maybe those forums. Is that bringing a whole different level of conversation and value? Yeah, I think so. So the biggest decision we made really was around the timing. And we specifically chose uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, which you know, probably not, not the best in terms of having people kind of tune in in mid-morning. But 10 o'clock Eastern is, you know, for me, 7 in the morning, LA, totally doable, uh, entirely doable in London, you know, 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Central York, 4 p.m. And it was vital for us. If you look at the people behind Health Reconsidered, awesome, like geographic uh, representation and awesome diversity actually within the team. And for me, like what really stands us out is having those point of views coming from around the world because they're just very, very different to your own. And with that, you know, I think you learn a little bit and take on board a little bit and you perhaps evolve your own thinking uh, for, the, for the better, in my opinion. So being an international, being global, being democratised, I think is a, is a key to its success. So it, it, importantly, fixing the right time, that's very difficult when you go for a global a, a approach. But now you've got all of that, let's be honest, getting that and actually delivering some change feels like an uphill battle but you've had some success. I mean, I've, I've seen that in some of your past. You've managed to change and move healthcare to this much more patient-centered approach. How do you take those messages and start to deliver that? I mean, I think we already have made real progress with Health Reconsidered. I mean, over the course of it's the community is six months old. Um, it's provided incredible insights, you know, somewhere in the region of sort of almost 200 hours worth of research which definitely informed the launch of the considered and the agency we wanted to be um, and trying to break the rules in healthcare communications and find new ways to support healthcare professionals and patients. But for me, the most tangible output is the white paper we produced, which is health control. And that's come about from all the learnings from health reconsidered combined with leading academic institutes and thought leaders from across healthcare. And for me, health control is a really, really powerful output from Health Reconsidered because we all want that sense of control, right? And we've all, through the pandemic, got a better understanding of how it is to be a patient and the anxiety and the unknown and the loss of control that comes with that. So for me, the idea of health control has come from these daily clubhouse discussions. You know, we've gone through and we've worked on it together and we've validated it, got new ideas and new insights. And now that white paper's published And I'm watching it, you know, build real traction within life sciences and within pharma because it makes total sense. Do you know what I mean? Health control. You know, I want it as as a parent. I want it for me. I'm sure you're, you know, listening to it going, yeah, I'd like a bit of health control in the current world in which we operate. Um, And it applies for healthcare professionals. And really, I feel like it's the role pharma can play in trying to deliver health control through this sense of understanding, uh, trust and education. So, I, you know, almost feels like a secret source. I think, you know, Clubhouse has sat out there. There's been, you know, obviously the high profile folks and I get some time with them. That's been an attractant. This is quite different. Do you think an average CEO from a hospital or a, an innovation officer should be doing this? Is this like a, this should be part of the job description? I don't think I'd do my job again without it. And, and I'm not convinced. I'm with you, right? I don't think I'm talking about Clubhouse here so much as the idea of of this global, vibrant community. So for me, Clubhouse is is a tool and a platform and a vehicle that allows me to do the really important bit. And the really, really important bit, you know, in some ways has been enabled from the pandemic because you're not in an office, so you're not having that, you know, sort of day-to-day dialogue and exchange. Uh, You're not having that commute. You know, you're not making the coffee and all these things. So 
for me, I've just found a different way to educate and inform and develop my own knowledge. And, and that just happens to be on Clubhouse, but it is through creating this global community of people who, the bit I love about it the most is I just fundamentally don't understand all the people on the platform. I have absolutely no idea of their background. I've no idea of the context. I've got no idea where the point of view comes from. And that's awesome. That's amazing. And I can listen to it and I can sort of build it into my, my knowledge bank, not because I necessarily agree to it, but because at least I'm aware of it. So yeah, that, so do I think, do I think everyone should be on Clubhouse? No. Do I think everyone should be open to different opinions? 100%. Right. So I, I think the, the pathway to this is the openness. The, the Clubhouse is just one of the versions or the channels. I think the problem with many channels in my mind is that they're I, I, essentially closed systems. I mean, you, you talked about them at the outset. I go to a conference, inevitably, I'm surrounded by the same people I probably mix with. I'm sort of reminded of the time when I was much younger and I knew nobody. I remember my first telehealth conference too many years ago and I knew nobody. So I had to randomly go up. It was a something of a challenge and also a little bit <laughs> depressing because I had people walk away. It was almost like dating. <laughs> so if that's the case and that's most people's experience, I'm not sure that there are other platforms that people can explore. I, I, you must be thinking about that. Yeah, I, 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 I do agree with that. You know, I think maybe it's in tandem. I think the most important thing is but open to those different opinions and, and, and wanting to invest the time you know, to hear them, which is what I do every day. Um, Clubhouse has definitely been an incredible enabler. But let, let's just go like pre-pandemic and let's just go, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the local coffee shop and I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to have some conversations with, with people that are there. Well, immediately those people, are, they're in the fundamentally the coffee shop that's around your corner. You know, if they've got children, they probably go to the same school, probably eating the same restaurants, watching the same box set on Netflix. And really, I think what Clubhouse has done is just create this like incredible global community where you're not meeting people in the same zip code. And that that's what I love the most about it. So I think the geography is, again, part of it. I, what's also interesting to me is that it creates a slightly safer space. And that's not to suggest that people can't be inappropriate and do all of those things. But because this is a, a digital format, I'm, I feel so. Because part of me, as I was listening to you going to a coffee shop and starting up a conversation, I've certainly done that, but I've certainly had some people look at me as if to say, who, you're talking to me? Yeah. I mean, I've never done that, but, <laughs> I, but I know what you're saying. The other thing that I like about it that's really nice is it's, it really like breaks down silos in terms of very serendipitous, do you know what I mean, in terms of the people who are there and the people you're having conversations with. So I feel it, it breaks down silos within health, breaks down silos uh, within society. And even, you know, my focus on Tuesday, I talk about creativity in healthcare. It breaks down silos there because you have creatives coming from all these different agencies that normally would never talk with one another because they're inherently competitive. Mm. And, and for whatever reason, you know, when we host a session, they're all like, you know, talking and chatting and helping one another out and, you know, driving better ideas. So maybe it is the spirit that we've been able to develop and, and maybe we won't always be able to retain that. Um, and that's why I say, I don't know where this is going to go. I just am appreciating it for the moment. And that's really why I saw it as an experiment. And, and, I, and I don't mind if that experiment comes to an end at a particular point, because we've learned loads through it. And, and that, I think, is, is one of the most important things that I'm the biggest advocate for. I, I mean, let's be clear. If we haven't learned that experiments or, or even successful things shouldn't come to an end. You only have to look at some of the television series that went way past their lifetime. I think the Fonz yeah, I, was one, I believe. Jumping the shark is the thing that people talk about in this country. So I, I agree with you, you know, but it's letting things go sometimes is the challenge. So you, you've had great success. You see all of these insights. You've developed this uh, health control paper that's now being shared, published, where do you think this is going and how can other people get engaged and participate in this? Because this feels like this is not just a CEO or a doctor or a nurse or, you know, a hospital worker or, you know, just a regular patient. We're all invested in this. How do we get involved and start to change it 
so that the system is working for us. I mean, the reason I do what I do is obviously I work in healthcare communications. That, that, that's my kind of space. And it's really interesting that you talk so, and we both have spoken so positively around experimentation, because when it comes to healthcare communications and when it comes to farmer advertisement, experimentation is like the very last word that's used. And for me, you know, sadly, it is, and everyone knows this, it's really formulaic. And I, and I understand why. People are on it under enormous like fiscal pressure to drive, you know, and maintain success. And therefore it's easier to go down the kind of beaten path in this proven, you know, way of kind of doing things. But what the pandemic's shown us, what this massive uptake in technology across society and the confidence for people to use it, and then platforms like Clubhouse is there's better ways of doing this. There's better and it and it comes down to that notion of experimentation. So, you know. About three weeks ago, we launched the agency that considered, which which I mentioned before. Now, let's go back five years ago or even two years. You know, when you launch an agency, it just kind of comes into existence and, and then slowly you kind of gather momentum. And, and that's basically how it works. You know, our launch event had 2,000 people registered for it. Over the course of a week, uh, we had 500 visitors a day to our website, almost 5,000 day social interactions. And all of it was just through fresh thinking. And also, not all of it worked. Everyone's looking at it and going, oh, it's the best ever launch. And everyone around knows the name of this agency. Yeah, like 30% of what we tried didn't work at all. But, but the 70% did. And it all comes down to this, whether it's Clubhouse, whether it's using Fiverr, whether it's new approaches to content. It's all just about, I think, really working with passion, working with creativity, breaking the rules that others follow, and all geared around trying to improve health outcomes, whether that's through supporting healthcare professionals, supporting patients, supporting the families, you know, it's using creativity and communication to make that happen. So you, you focus on outcomes and, and the, the individual and the patient. You've created essentially a, a space that allows for trial and error with an acceptance of an er- errors, which I think is somewhat unusual, at least in the circles that I'm in. Is that a core element of this? I mean, I feel like we're terrible accepting error, certainly in healthcare, you know, and healthcare errors have a whole separate meaning when it comes to medicine. Yeah. So obviously there are many, many, many good rules that are in place for very, very, very good reasons. Uh, and they need to be adhered and respected hundred percent. And then there are things that just seem to become rules over time and they're just ways of doing things. And you somewhat follow them and you go, oh, I'm not sure this makes sense, but but, you know, it's the way it's always been and I'm told to do it. So I'm, I'm going to kind of do it. And they're the rules that we want to break. And, and one of them goes back to the very first thing we said. So, oh, you know, we can't really use innovation technology when we're supporting patients. Oh, my God, that is a rule I fully intend to try and break. And when we were establishing, you know, this positioning of breaking the rules, others follow, it did like loads of focus groups and spoke to loads of spoke to those potential partners and said, hey, you know, what, what do you think about this as a positioning, breaking the rules, just follow. And there'll be those that go, ah, oh, that's exactly what I want. It's that kind of fresh thinking, that kind of confidence and that kind of wisdom you're bringing to drive change that love. And then there are other people going, ah, oh, you know, I'm not sure we can do that. And I'm cool with that. I'm absolutely cool with how self-selecting that statement is because I know to drive change, it requires the right kind of partnership. And I'm super comfortable being selected in, in who those partnerships are with. Yeah, so everybody doesn't have to participate. I think taking the risk and those that are comfortable with it and finding the level of risk, obviously in different circumstances, different risk. You, you know, what, one of the things I would say the general population is not great at is assessing risk in, in you know, from a um, gauging choices necessarily, particularly when it's long-term risk. One of the reasons we have such a terrible obesity epidemic is that the short-term gain or whatever we struggle with to sort of re- reconcile. But for me, this is really interesting. There's some core elements to this that I, I would sort of highlight, break the rules. That seems to be one of them. Out, thinking outside the box almost sounds mundane, but you've done that in a different way and continue to do it. Once your uh, version doesn't work, you go find other areas. And then ultimately having this anchor around healthcare outcomes, which we're all vested in. So for me, this is great 
fascinating work that I think is an imperative for all of us. Yeah, I mean, that was a very nice summary. I uh, get real, and you're probably the same. I'm sure everyone listening to this is probably the same. One of my biggest frustrations in our space is what I call like propaganda, spin, sales messages. And it's when people are tripping over technology to try and be like the smartest person in the room. And the thing that I love, even about Health Reconsidered on Clubhouse, just did it. We just did it. And, and that for me is the most important thing that we're not just talking we're actually driving meaningful change and we're actually having a positive impact. And that's why, yeah, there were times on Clubhouse when there's just like me and a friend and you're going, is this the right thing to do? Yeah, it is. And we're going to commit to it. And we're going to keep trying because we're either going to prove it or we're going to prove it doesn't work. And I'm a, I'm a big believer in action and change and making it happen. Fantastic. Dave, thanks for joining me today. No, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Can you find your community outside the echo chamber? Do you think, like David, listening to your customers means you must have that channel in your job now and in the future? Or do you have another solution or tool that works in your world? If we are really to make healthcare better, we have to listen to our customers. In the case of healthcare, that extends to everyone in the system, striving each and every day to deliver great care to our patients, their parents, siblings, children, and friends. Your better pill to swallow for better healthcare services and solutions starts by challenging your world, getting smarter every day by stepping out of your current space filled with like-minded people and like-minded views. Find and open your channel to voices, ideas and opinions you have not heard yet. Thanks for joining me, your host, Dr. Nick, on this week's edition of Healthcare Upside Down. Until next week, keep solving the business of healthcare as if your life depended on it, as one day soon, it will. That's all the time we have for today. You can find all of our episodes on your favorite listening platform by searching for Healthcare Now Radio. Also, check out our blog at ecgmc.com slash hud for summaries and commentary from each episode. Follow our show's social hashtag, HC Upside Down. And join us each week as we work to solve the business of healthcare for everyone.